We recently saw a fairly viral story. An Amazon driver accused a woman of having white privilege, demanding she check her white privilege. And after she refused, there was a scuffle and the Amazon driver beat the 67 year old woman. The woman had apparently complained about a delivery not being correct. And the person said, check your white privilege. And then, you know, a beating occurred of an elderly woman. It's not the only story that we've heard like this. There's been some pretty creepy stories. There was a young man in Chicago who was taken hostage and tortured on camera live on Facebook. Now, how do these things happen? Well, for first and foremost, violence happens. I think people will always find an excuse to be violent. And sometimes people are just violent. People of all races and all backgrounds can attack each other. That happens. So maybe we're looking too much into these stories. Maybe we see a story where someone mentions white privilege. And the reality is it's just they're just saying nasty things, right? We also have this story where a Black Lives Matter protester yells at an Asian cop. Uh, well, he just makes a bunch of racially disparaging comments. Why? Well, critical race theory suggests that Asians are white adjacent. He then uses racial slurs and says that black people can't be racist. Now, these ideas are overtly based in critical race theory, which brings me to the escalation and one of the more dangerous stories. This is from Newsweek. Research article in medical journal describes whiteness as a malignant, parasitic-like condition. Okay, does anybody really take this stuff seriously? We say it all the time. A lot of people uh, who are moderates, intellectual dark web types, and we'll, we'll get into the conflict in the intellectual dark web. But a lot of these people will say, oh, it's fringe. It's nonsense. It's, it's just one stupid article by one dumb person. Ignore this. Uh, okay. Well, we did, you know, so back during Gamergate and uh, Comics Gate and all these other culture war gates, people said, it's just comic books. Who cares? So don't buy them. And I think that's fair. You know, I, I just won't buy them. Let the industry correct itself. Let the market take care of these things. But the ideology is pervasive and invasive, and it's in government. It's in institutions that cannot fail. Universities can, but likely won't. They have endowments and government can't because it's backed by guns. So when the wokeness and these, these, these insane theories are permeating into these institutions, yeah, then we're in trouble. So it starts simply with many intellectual dark web types and liberal types saying, I know it's bad, but it's just in this one place. It's just one professor. It's just one school. Then the rhetoric escalates. And it's not just one article saying whiteness as property. It's not just one journalist saying it. It skyrockets. More and more people start adopting this ideology and the rhetoric gets insane to the point where we have a research article where they say whiteness is a malignant parasitic like condition. And I'll read and we'll, 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 we'll break down some of the ideas in this in this uh, this research article. But do you see where this leads to planting the seeds of racial hatred will lead to racial violence? You will see someone scream, check your white privilege and then beat a person. I have heard stories. I mean, look, you see that black man yelling at the Asian officer saying racial slurs against Asians. That's not too far away from the, the hardcore violence. Now, I know the left likes to say, if you tolerate hate speech, then it results in violence. And I'm like, yeah, so we are critical of those who are espousing violence and we're critical of institutionalization of overt racism. And we got to be careful. It's hard. You know, there are some people who want to do research into transgender uh, uh, issues and race and IQ issues, and it's considered taboo to even go anywhere near it. But science should be allowed and should be protected. The problem arises with the anti-scientific and the overtly insane and hateful. It's a fine line, though. I'm not going to pretend I have all the answers. I think the left does have good points about a lot of these things. And I think we've talked about it. When someone comes out and says a bunch of racist things, I'm glad. Now I know to stay away from them. I think it's a problem. When science says something is true, like certain people of certain racial backgrounds are taller or shorter, I mean, those things exist. We need to be able to talk about it rationally while also being critical of those who are hateful. Which brings me to this story. Newsweek reports, a research article published last month by the Journal of American Psychoanalytic Association called Whiteness a Malignant Parasitic-Like Condition. That description, along with other language in the article, has caused public anger, and the backlash against the author was evident on social media. The article titled On Having Whiteness was written by Dr. Donald Moss, a white man who is a faculty member of both the New York Psychoanalytic Institute 
and the San Francisco Center for Psychoanalysis. In the article, Moss wrote that white people have a particular susceptibility to the parasitic condition, which he claims renders its host's appetites voracious, insatiable, and perverse. He explained he believed whiteness establishes entitled dominion that enables the host to have power without limit force, without restriction, violence without mercy, and increases one's drive to terrorize. This is racist. This is absurd. You need only look to, I don't know, Mao to talk about violence without mercy and terrorizing people. You need only look to, I don't know, wasn't Shaka Zulu like this despotic warlord dude in Africa? I mean, he was pretty like he was a legit warrior, man. Genghis Khan. Now, a lot of people talk about the virtues of some of these people. But yeah, violent despotism, it exists everywhere. And I don't think we're, we're here to highlight the virtues of awful, awful people. You know, what, what, what is the joke? Ricky Gervais said that even Hitler liked dogs or something. Sure, we get it. We call them out for their awfulness. We, 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 we get it. People drink water. Everybody drinks water. You don't make those comparisons. The point is, this guy is saying it's whiteness. That's racism and hatred. And we have to protest against that. So I'll, I'll put it this way. If there was a guy at a university who said on having blackness, I'd say the exact same things. That was civil rights. We're past that. It's the left that's bringing back the hatred. They're going to say Moss has previously lectured on the subject of whiteness before having uh, before on having whiteness was published in the bi-monthly peer reviewed journal of the American Psychoanalytic Association on May 27th. On May 27th in 2019, he delivered his theory describing whiteness as a parasitic condition as a plenary address for the South African Psychoanalytical Association. And he also lectured on it at the New York Psychoanalytic Society and Institute and the Center for Modern Psychoanalytic Studies in New York. Moss is the author of multiple psychology, psychology books and a forthcoming collection he edited entitled Hating, Abhorring, and Wishing to Destroy. Psychoanalytic Essays on the Contemporary Moment will be published this fall. Moss is also a founding member of a climate group known as the Green Gang, which describes itself as a collective focusing on climate change and its denial. Now, Let's talk about free speech for a second. There have been many uh, uh, situations in which Ben Shapiro or Ann Coulter are invited to speak at, co at college campuses, invited to speak, not to publish peer-reviewed academic research, and they're protested rather violently. That's wrong. If Dr. Donald Moss would like to go and stand up and speak and give this lecture, I think he should absolutely be able to. And I think it is then incumbent upon all of us who oppose racism and hate speech to say, Here's why this guy is wrong to prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. Otherwise, what happens is, I mean, you can try the cult indoctrination stuff the left does, but people eventually say, I reject these things. Why? Because you need real and sound arguments. Now, I don't like the idea that this guy is publishing in peer reviewed journals and is considered a respectable academic. I don't like the idea that universities would platform racism and all that stuff. But if you want to get into science, well, then there's going to be a lot of deplorable garbage like this. And I think these this on having whiteness research uh, paper could be very, very damaging to social discourse, to our society, to the world. So what do we do? I make a video right here explaining why he's insane. And I hope you share it to explain to people why these ideas are bad. I don't say delete or ban the idea. I say, bring it on, mother effer. I'm going to prove that you're insane. I can only I, I only need to say a few words. Genghis Khan, that guy swept across Asia, taken everything over. People of any race can be authoritarian despots and can seize and steal resources from other people. Simple argument. Hopefully that was enough to make you question the insanity that these people are pushing. And if it wasn't for him, how would I prove to people they're this insane? You see, the, you see the point? This does plant a seed, which could lead to extreme violence if it's not opposed. And that's why we oppose it through ideas to prove to people we are, the, we, we, we are right. We are the good guys. They're the bad guys. They're going to say on Twitter, the response to Moss's article has been outraged with user comments like, this racist vomit should be called out for what it is. And with pretense of academic rigor by a fellow uh, white, no surprise, it's in a psychoanalytic journal. Psychologist Dr. Philip Pellegrino tweeted in response, how do my colleagues consider this scholarship? Really? He says, does anyone actually take it seriously? 
Moss also wrote that he felt whiteness easily infiltrates even groups founded on the protection of individuals on democratic principles. Moss also postulated treatment for the condition. Effective treatment consists of a combination of psychic and social historical interventions. Such interventions can reasonably aim only to reshape whiteness's infiltration, infiltrated appetites, to reduce their intensity, redistribute their arms, their aims, and occasionally turn those aims towards the work of reparation. Moss wrote an abstract summary for the journal. When remembered and, rep- and represented, the ravages wreaked by the chronic condition can function either as warning, never again, or as temptation, great again. Even with treatment, Moss wrote, there is no guarantee against regression. And there is not yet a permanent cure. Clearly meant to be bombastic. I think these people hold insane views, and I think they push insane things for in- insane reasons. But this guy is clearly trying to get a rise out of people. And you know what? Okay, I get it. Congratulations, good sir. You've got me and many other people talking about it. But what you need to understand is that these abhorrent racist ideas have been around for a long time. And it's only recently that we've begun to actually challenge them, which actually is worrying to me, but maybe it's a good thing. You know, maybe the real issue is that these ideas have been pervasive for decades, for for a couple generations now, and we weren't paying attention. Or maybe it's just started growing and getting worse. You may have seen this story. 7-17-2020. 7-17-2020. In Smithsonian, race guidelines, rational thinking, and hard work are white values. I want to take this and I want to show you this story, which we all talked about last year, and put it in the context of what this researcher is saying about whiteness being parasitic. Let's talk about what they have claimed. Going back to, I think this is the early 90s, they put up these, these, these claims. Aspects and assumptions of whiteness and white culture in the United States. Let me start by saying, Hard work is not uh, whiteness. Uh, Being on time, scheduling is not whiteness. Anybody can work hard. Anybody can be smart. Anybody can be successful. There are there are many very wealthy and successful black men and Latinos, Mexicans, people from Nigeria. They got this amazing technology center called the iHub. There are many successful Asians, many success, successful um, uh, Middle Eastern individuals. This idea that it's all white culture is insane. I mean, I'm pretty sure we use Arabic numerals for our math. Here's what they say. Rugged individualism. Yeah, the individual is the primary unit, self-reliance, independence and autonomy, highly valued, rewarded. Individual assumed to be in control over their environment. You get what you deserve. Personal responsibility, like doing work to support yourself. Go to Asia. Go to Japan. I mean, dude, people in Japan, they have seppuku. I don't know how prominent it is these days, but when they dishonor their community because they were not properly responsible, they kill themselves. Like, dude, brutal. They hold themselves personally responsible. I mean, that's individualism. You look at China. I mean, sure, they have authoritarian systems, but people are only forced to fall in line. People are individuals family structure, as if people in Asia don't have families, as if people in Africa don't have families. That's insane. Emphasis on the scientific method used by everyone around the world, not just white people. Now, think about these things, which I'm I'm sure you've seen all of this. We've we've argued about it a lot, right? Protestant work ethic and status, power and authority. What that guy is saying is that it is a parasitic condition for you to work hard. What should we do then? Well, let's think about it. Right now, we have abundance and technology, and the scientific method absolutely led us to this point. That's a good thing, you know, it makes life better. Let's go back to a couple hundred years ago. You know, uh, I love referencing the movie The Patriot with Mel Gibson. What do they do? They wake up, they farm, they go to bed. They wake up, they farm, they go to bed. They wake up, they farm, they go to bed. Those people worked really, really hard. They worked on a schedule. Should they have not? Should they have just died? They were farming to support themselves and their families. They farmed for food to feed their families. They weren't big factory farms. If you want to criticize corporatism and the modern economic condition, hey, I'm right there with you. But if you want to claim that the idea of having a farm is is whiteness, bro, before white people even made it to Europe, we had agriculture. It's an insanely racist notion. Leads us towards a dangerous and dark path where, yeah, I think this pervasive ideology will lead to extreme violence and we must push back against it. I, I appreciate the free speech. I think these people should be allowed to speak. The challenge is, are we not strong enough to reject and resist? 
Therein lies the bigger challenge. These ideas have not been, uh, are not new. They've been around for quite some time. Why? Here's an article from 1993 in the Chicago Tribune, Whiteness as Property by James Warren. And they just basically talk about this idea. Critical race theory suggests that whiteness is property, that it's something you have, you're inheriting, you're born with. That's ridiculous. You could then theoretically say Asianness is property. Why? Because if you're a, say you're born, you're Korean and you're born in America, but like full Korean, you know, you can just go to Korea and you'd probably fit in. Oh, that's, that's, that's uh, Asianness as property. Well, that's absurd. Now, there are realities of racism in, the, in, in this world. Uh, notably, I get treated uh, poorly. Well, I went to Seoul and I had many people explain to me that uh, being part Korean, I'm lesser. They're very ethno-nationalistic. They're very supremacist about being Korean. It's changing as, as time goes on, but it is still very much that way. The same is true for, for Japan. Some people argue they're an ethno state. Many people say they aren't, but they are overwhelmingly homogeneously Japanese. And it is very hard for foreigners to get access to their economic system. There are realities of going to other countries and whether or not being a certain race will be beneficial or not. These people have an extremely Amerocentric worldview. And it, and, and it, it extends well beyond America. They think that whiteness is everything, as if the, the accomplishments of Asia and, yes, the accomplishments of those in Africa are just secretly white. No, I, I, can't, I can't stand for that. That is insanely racist. We, we have made math uh, uh, w- was progressed by uh, people in the Middle East, Arabic numerals, like I said, people in Europe, they invent, it, t- it took them a thousand years. Did you know this? That the, the people in China invented the compass a thousand years, 1000 before Europeans invented the compass. So don't give me none of that BS. Get your whiteness as property racist trash out of my face. Or does it lead to? If we institutionalize racial hatred, it's going to lead to racial violence. We've had it before. We don't want it coming back. If people want to go and have a stupid little tiki torch march, let them do it. And we can all post the photos over and over again saying they're dumb. And these people are now have now fled and don't show their faces anymore. They regret it because we said your racist ideas are bad. We've got to do the same thing to the critical race theorists, to the critical theorists in general. Otherwise, you will get more racial violence. So when they come to our universities, we welcome them. We say, thank you so much for coming. Why are you so dumb? Of course, we don't say it just like that. You challenge them. You sit down and you say, let's talk about these ideas. I was in Berkeley and I was debating some race realists and they were talking about a bunch of different countries. And they're like, people from this country, it was, I'll tell you this. They were like people from Somalia, you know, their IQs are low. And whenever, even when you control for environment. And I was like, I mean, Somalia has been going through famine and drought and civil war. And they're like, yeah, but even controlling for all those things. And I'm like, right, but there's like literal physical effects of someone who's malnourished, who has children, and those children will be impaired. It's not a race thing. You take a a white family, malnourish them and dehydrate them for years, and then they'll have kids. Those kids will be less well, like physically, like harmed by this. The left talks about that. It's a true thing. But they say, yeah, well, you know, we control for all these factors. And I'm like, look, there are countries next to Somalia that are not the same. I mean, there's got to be some overlap if you are right. I don't believe them. I do believe that there is a mix of nature and nurture. I do believe that nature and nurture play a role. And I think that if you starve someone and then, you know, they they end up being shorter because they didn't have the food to grow and develop and then they have kids, those kids will be, will, will more likely perform less well. I think poverty is the driving factor for so much of this. And, and, it, and it falls completely in line with evolutionary science and natural selection. The fittest survive and have fitter children and those who are not as fit struggle and then eventually are selected a- away from. So if you want to come to me with this race realism stuff, I'll say I can certainly respect the idea of, you know, people in, uh, in Thailand are shorter on average than I am because I've personally, personally witnessed it. And people in Nordic countries are taller on average. Crazy thing being in like Norway and Sweden and just like looking up at all the towering people, very tall people. Yeah, because genetics are a real thing. But it's, it's, it's one thing when people take it to the extreme. Either it's the absolute defining factor, which I'm not saying every single person is arguing, or that whiteness is, you know, I just, I'll just put it this way. The reason I bring up the race realist stuff is to say, I debate it. 
Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm not. Whatever. The point is, I got no problem with these people wanting to come to me and say these things. I'll be like, I think you're wrong. I think you're really wrong. I think you miss a whole lot of these things. And I need to be more persuasive. Just silencing people isn't going to work. So what do we have here? Someone pushing an abhorrent worldview. Horrifying. We challenge it. We tell them it's wrong. We push back. We prove to people through persuasion, resourcefulness, and just knowledge and wisdom. And we also point out the very obvious. What do you, what do you expect to happen when you push this whiteness as property? What do you want? Do you, what, what's your goal? It's probably just seizing power, mind you. But it brings me to the, the last little bit here, the, the fight in the intellectual dark web. Claire Lehman of Quillette says that James Lindsay is peddling white genocide theory, implying that a genocide against whites in the U.S. is imminent, has the potential to inspire racist violence. Such comments are extreme, reckless, and irresponsible. They should be denounced. i uh, starting to feel like Claire has James Lindsay derangement syndrome because as much as I think there's things to criticize James Lindsay for, he's a bit bombastic. I've talked to him about it. He didn't do that. He didn't say that. In fact, he chimes in. And I think I have the tweet from him. He said, uh, James Lindsay says, I said that the woke ideology contains the seed of a genocide. The evidence for that is actually overwhelming. Perhaps Claire doesn't know what seeds are or how they work. Do they even have plants in Australia? Dave Rubin said, I know you have some beef with them, and I don't know how I don't know the specific comments you're referring to. But conceptual James has been on point about all of this and just extrapolates it to its obvious conclusion. Anti-white laws are coming. Maybe it isn't as pervasive in Australia yet. I'm not quite sure why Claire is so heavily going after James Lindsay. I mean, seriously, I don't know. I understand some of the, you know, some of the earlier criticisms. But at this point, when you have someone beating an elderly woman and scre- and yelling at her about her white privilege, I'm like, yeah, racial hatred leads to racial, vi- racial violence. We've seen it happen in other countries. We don't want it to happen again. What James Lindsay is saying, denouncing it is not encouraging it. So we should all speak up against it. Whatever. I kind of feel like, like I said in the earlier segment, we are, we are, it's, it's not just, you know, Sisyphus pushing the boulder up the hill. It's actually rolling backwards on us. It worries me. But uh, I guess I'll just say this. I feel bad for all y'all white people. See, Tim Pool is mixed race. So, <laughs> you know, I get a free pass. I don't. Nah, sorry. Whiteness has nothing to do with race, they say. And Asians are also white. So here we go. They're extremists. They're insane. Call them what they are and reject this stuff. I'll leave it there. Next segment's coming up at 4 p.m. over at youtube.com slash Timcast. Thanks for hanging out, and I will see you all then.